Welcome back, everyone, to another episode of the Biff Bites Podcast. How is everyone doing today? Relocked and loaded. Awesome, awesome. I'm your host, Jerry Mee, uh, joined, as always, by the three musketeers, Adam, Mike, and Brendan. How are you guys doing? I think we've been promoted, guys. <laughs> yeah, this is great news. One for all. And all for one. Yeah. <laughs> Uh, with that, though, I guess should we get right into the question of the episode, boys? Let's do it. Let's do it. Well, with everything going on in the news lately, I figured it would be a good time to revisit uh, fiscal and monetary policy. So I got a little bit of a doozy of a question for us. So let's see what you guys think. Uh, if the U.S. is experiencing high unemployment, falling stock prices and declining consumer spending that sounds kind of familiar don't don't you think <laughs> then what actions will congress or the fed most likely take a the fed will lower the prime rate b the fed will sell securities c congress will authorize spending programs or d the Fed will raise the discount rate. So a couple things going on here. They're actually testing a couple topics here, even though it do- might not seem like it. Uh, but there's a couple things going on. What What are your guys' first thoughts when you see a question like this? Is there not a choice for fix the damn pandemic? Pandemic? <laughs> no, not an option. No, no option E. Sorry, Mike. Well, that wouldn't be that wouldn't be correct anyway because it says yeah. stock prices are falling. Yeah, right. So okay, <laughs> I don't know. I'm stumped then. And, I'm and, stumped. And Tesla found the cure. <clears throat> yes. <laughs> <laughs> so what what do we think about a the Fed will lower the prime rate? Non-starter. Non-starter. How come? So I feel that like the CFP board loves throwing that option in here. Why is that blatantly wrong? Why should people just see? red flags when they see that option on this type of question because the fed has absolutely zero direct control over prime rate certainly their actions influence prime rate but prime rate is not set by the fed yep and if you take nothing else away from this question that is the number one lesson i feel because the cfp board loves testing this concept i saw when i took the exam i've seen it on dozens if not hundreds of practice tests the cfp board loves testing your knowledge of does the fed set the prime rate uh which i feel makes sense because you know people kind of associate it the fed takes actions and those actions influence the prime rate and people in their mind just associate the two but it's just not the case the fed doesn't have any you know real say over what the prime rate is going to be um, Adam, can you explain kind of just what the what the prime rate is in a nutshell? Um, I'm going to defer to Brendan on this. <laughs> okay. <laughs> we'll edit that out. Mike, you want to take that instead? <laughs> I like Adam's answer. <laughs> okay. <laughs> Brendan, so, Brendan, can you explain what the prime rate is in a nutshell? Yeah. So we've got we've got three rates, three main rates that, that are, are part of our economic scenario. Uh, the discount rate, which is set by the Fed. Uh, the Fed funds rate, which is the rate at which member banks lend money short term to one another, uh, and then the prime rate, which is the rate at which banks lend to their best clients. Uh, the Fed sets directly the uh, discount rate, uh, and then they certainly will look to influence heavily the Fed funds rate because it's bad for our economy if, if they don't have some sort of control, but they don't directly set that either. Uh, and then the prime rate is kind of determined by each bank. Um, what their what their rate is. so the prime rate is a market rate uh and then most of the, the best borrowers will, will borrow at prime which at right now i think it's a 3.75 percent uh and then you know a lot of borrowers will borrow at prime plus some spread so you might be borrowing at five and three quarters which would be at prime plus two yeah so i mean there's definitely ripple effects there you know actions that the fed takes influence the prime rate but it's not like the fed just goes to you know JP Morgan or Bank of America or some other bank and say, hey, listen, this is what you guys set your prime rate at. This is what it's going to be. You know, no ifs, ands or buts. Right. The, the Fed can influence it and they can tweak the knobs and pull the levers, but they don't actually get to you know say what it is at the end of the day. 
what about uh, options B and D? The Fed will sell securities or the Fed will raise the discount rate. What's going on with those uh, options? I process these as if will this action bring money into the economy or take money out of the economy? And so B and D, I look at as as taking money out, tightening. Right. So when the Fed sells securities, the key thing to keep in mind is not so much that the securities are entering the market, but that the fact that the Fed is uh, taking money out of the market. You know, I kind of think about it in terms of uh, Monopoly, the board game. You know, when you sell to the bank, you're that's a money sink. You are removing money from the economy. The Fed isn't going to turn around and, you know, spend that money, at least not right away. The Fed is taking that money off the market and basically putting it into the bank in not the monopoly bank reserves, getting it off the market so it can't be spent. And that'll actually slow an economy down because there's just less money out there to be loaned out or to be put into investments. Yeah, it has the, the impact of making money more expensive, right? So there's there's a lack of supply, uh, which which increases the cost of borrowing. Right. So the, the Fed's just putting securities out there. It doesn't really matter what those securities are. The important part is that they're just taking money off the market. Uh, what about the Fed raising the discount rate? So that is something the Fed can do. It, the discount rate isn't the prime rate. The discount rate is something that the Fed can influence. That's right. And by by raising the discount rate, um, it's it's similar to any lending rate. Uh, loans will seem more appealing. Uh, people will be more motivated if rates are low. Uh, you see that a lot with home mortgages. Um, and people will be more discouraged uh, when rates are high. And if the Fed in this scenario were to raise the discount rate, it really wouldn't accomplish that goal of infusing more capital into the economy um, and hoping to change its course. Yeah, like let's let's bring that down to a level that, you know, most the average consumer can understand. You know, let's say you want to put an addition on your house and you decide you want to go to the bank to get a loan for that addition on your house. Well, you go to the bank and you see that uh, loan rates are through the roof. You know, they're super expensive right now. That might dissuade you from, you know, putting that addition. You don't actually want to take on this project because right now. Uh, the rates that you're going to pay on your loans are so high, it's just not worth it. So that dissuades you from actually taking those a uh, actions. And that's exactly what the Fed is doing on a national level. By increasing those rates, they're dissuading people from you know taking these actions that add to the economy, add additions on to the economy. Uh, they're trying to dissuade that because they're afraid that the economy is overheating. So... B and D would actually have the opposite effect. It would, uh, if the Fed took those actions, it would probably push all of these uh, issues that we're seeing in the question uh, into an even worse uh, area. You know, it would probably increase unemployment, cause stock prices to fall even further, and also cause consumer spending to go down because people don't want to take these actions because rates are so high. So what does that leave us with, gentlemen? Congress spending money, which they hate to do. <laughs> they hate to do, but they seem to do it a lot. Yeah. Yeah. So that would definitely, so that's a fiscal policy action. So anything that's done by Congress is, is, is known as fiscal policy, which is the taxing and spending of a government. And then we have the central bank or in or the case of the United States, the Fed would be a monetary policy decision. So this would be a fiscal policy reaction to stress uh, and would be an appropriate reaction to the scenario posed in the question. Right. So we are left with our correct answer of C, Congress will authorize spending programs that injects more money into the economy and hopefully reverses those trends that we see in the, in the uh, question. So the correct answer is C, Congress will authorize spending programs. And Brennan, I think that was a great segue into our kind of first topic of the episode, uh, monetary versus fiscal policy. And you know, how it affects real life and also why it's important for the CFP exam. Yeah. Um, and, and, you know, what, what's interesting is that for people that are actually going through the curriculum right now or people that are studying for the CFP exam, uh, it, it's, it's a, 
a neat experience to be able to, to kind of learn about theory and actually seeing it applied in real time. And, and so you're able to take a look at what Congress and what the Fed and other central banks around the world uh, are doing in reaction to, you know, that just a huge economic cliff that has been created from the, the uh, social reaction to the, to the virus. Uh, so you're able to take a look at say, okay, well, based on the question that I'm seeing or based on the scenario that I'm looking at, um, how can I relate it to what's going on today to understand whether or not I want to choose tightening or loosening monetary or fiscal policy? Definitely. So just to kind of start us off with this topic, I think it's good to uh, get a nice baseline. Uh, can someone just give us a quick rundown of the difference between monetary and fiscal and why that distinction is important? Well, a as you were discussing with the question um, of the episode, uh, the monetary policy is, is, is all about rates and whether um, they want more money to flow, less money to flow. The rates, as Brennan said, control the attractiveness of, of borrowing. So if, if rates are raised, um, it's not as attractive and that has the effect of um, limiting the supply of money in the marketplace. Whereas fiscal is just Congress deciding whether to by investing in stimulus programs or projects, building bridges, roads, dams, whatever, um, they are bringing money into the economy through that expenditure. Yeah, the way in, in my mind that I associate it is fiscal is really fiscal policy where it, it's set by Congress. It's the it's the mood that they want to take. It's the you know direction they want to go in. Whereas monetary policy just feels much more tangible to me. It's much more of an exact science that the Fed is taking, trying, you know, twisting the knobs and pulling the levers to make the economy go in the direction that they want to go in. Yeah. And for the CFP exam, I um, kept them straight that the C in fiscal meant C for Congress, that Congress controls fiscal policy. Yeah. Uh, what, what were you going to say, Brendan? So, and I, I would say in normal times, um, fiscal policy sometimes is set by, you know, which party is in power and what the philosophy of, of taxing versus spending is in general. But in, in a crisis mode, fiscal policy is actually even a, a, a more efficient tool to try and stimulate the economy um, than monetary policy is. It's, it's, a, it's a much more surgical uh, and direct uh influence over over the economy than, than monetary policy. Monetary policy takes time to take shape, uh, whereas fiscal policy is, is pretty immediate. Yeah, that's a great point. I think probably one of the biggest examples of that is probably with like the New Deal during the Great Depression. Yeah, um, yep. yep. You know, they, Congress put all of these uh, programs into place to just basically put people to work. You know, Congress invented jobs overnight, the, uh, the national forestry, uh, the high, the, you know, the big, uh, I'm trying, I'm blanking on the name of the program, but it was like the Bri roads and bridges uh, 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 program to basically just build all of these roads and bridges. Yeah, and the WPA. Yes, thank you. Thank you. Exactly. Yeah. And it's like, yeah, nice. We needed these roads and bridges. That's great. But Congress wasn't doing it because we necessarily needed roads and bridges. Congress is doing it because people needed jobs. Yeah, I mean, they would create jobs of like, go clean the statue in the park. And that was someone's job. And it was just, it was, it was exactly to to just give somebody um, the, the ability to work and uh, to, to earn money for that for that job. The, um, you know, and it's kind of cool because sometimes you'll be walking through an older city and you'll, you'll be on a, an older part of the city and, and walking on the sidewalk and, and, and they would, you'll see if you look down, bronze uh, plaques in, in the cement of the sidewalk saying that this was a WPA project. Uh, and you know, those things are still out there. It's really kind of a, a neat connection to history. Yeah, definitely, definitely. So, and another point that uh, that Brendan you just mentioned in passing, but uh, Congress not only through spending programs but through through taxation uh, can can really exert some influence. It takes more time uh, for that to to come into effect. Uh, but if you look to the Tax Cuts and Jobs Act that was passed, I mean that shuffled the marginal tax brackets. Uh, dropped corporate AMT to zero. Uh, it, it took a whole bunch of itemized deductions off the table. It nearly doubled the standard deduction. Um, all of that is going to have 
some impact not only on the revenue that's coming in uh, to the government, but the the money that's in people's hands. And uh, in the U.S., I mean, you just look to the chunk of our GDP that's uh, earmarked for consumer spending. I mean, it's it's seventy percent. Yeah, and, and, uh, and you know, long term. So, so what we should say at the at the outset of this is that neither fiscal nor monetary policy are designed to be long term implements, right? That they're designed to be corrective. You know, we want we want this to to kind of get us on the path that we need to go. Whether they're trying to stimulate the economy or cool it down, but then once once the desired outcome, once we're on that trajectory, they they should pull those tools away. Uh, and that's certainly not what's been happening since since 2008, where we've had really long, like in a grand monetary policy experiment. Uh, but going back to Adam's point on on the the jobs uh, and and tax cut and jobs act, that that was a fiscal policy decision that was made during normal economic times and and um, uh, you know a fairly robust uh, addition, I think you could argue, to to, to discretionary spending. Um, but certainly, you know, part of what I was saying before, it's more of a philosophical thing than anything else. And then when we take a look at what Congress did in response to the coronavirus and the shutdowns that, that uh, came as a result, you know, that was not necessarily philosophical. It was just we need to we need to stop the boat from sinking. Right. So before we kind of move on to, you know, real world practicality that we're seeing in, in everyday life right now, what what's the big takeaway with this subject that you want students to know going into the CFP exam? And also, to be honest, this is relevant for the Series 7 and other FINRA exams as well. Yeah, I mean, I, I would say, oh, I'm sorry, Brendan. Go, go ahead, Adam. Um, I'd start just just get a, a basic understanding of of the business cycle i think that's a good yes. place to start Very important. uh start to understand what happens at various points in that cycle uh, because a likely line of questioning is you're going to get set up with an economic scenario and to be able to point to that and to be able to understand what happens at various points along our our ongoing business cycle is going to then help you to narrow down okay here's what things look like here's where we're theoretically headed. Um, now, what actions need to be taken to make sure that there's not a whole lot of hurt out there? Or, you know, uh, what what could we do to to really get things started in the economy? So I think if you have a good knowledge of the business cycle and develop an eye just based on some of those characteristics uh, throughout the business cycle, what's happening at any given point? Um, you know, what are the unemployment rates like? What is the inflation rate like? Uh, and then being able to put that together and come to a conclusion about, okay, here's where we're at. This would seem like a, a decent path forward on the monetary policy front. This is a, a good alternative if we're looking to get Congress involved. I think those are that's a, a good place to start. And, yeah. and I would break it down to simplicity. Going on what Mike was saying, draw pictures. You know, draw pictures that would like one is a dollar sign. The other one's the Fed. And in which way is the money flowing? Is it flowing out of the Fed or into the Fed? And the same thing with Congress is money. You know, if you're paying a lot of taxes, that's money flowing into Congress. If you're not paying a lot of taxes, that's money kind of coming back to you. Um, and, and so it helps you break those questions down just by drawing stupid little pictures. Uh, it will help you from from avoiding stupid mistakes. Yeah. And I, I do really love that tip you had, Mike, about the C and fiscal is for Congress, because once you get the business cycle down, once you get, you know, the direction down, the way people get tripped up all the time is they get tripped up on not remembering which policies are fiscal and which policies are monetary. So just keeping those straight. Remember, fiscal is for Congress. Monetary is for the Fed. I, I think I could have used another letter in, in fiscal to come up with <laughs> something for Congress. Oh, boy. Oh, boy. <laughs> Keeping a family rated, Brendan, family rated up in here. <laughs> so. Well, here's one. If 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 con is the opposite of pro, what's the opposite of progress? Yeah, there you go. Con. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, and more so, more more so as time goes on, it seems. Yep. So let's let's shift for, away from the exam real quick and let's let's apply it to everyday uh, life. You know, what's going on in the real world right now? How like you said, Brennan, for students who are studying this material, it's super interesting because they're seeing it in effect in every day. You know, what are we seeing right now 
uh, with fiscal policy and monetary policy. I mean, it's it's we've we've got uh, as, as many hooks in the water as as I think I've ever seen um, with, with both fiscal and monetary policy, and you know we've got we've got both Congress and the Fed uh, and the Fed working in coordination with other central banks uh, to to try and make economic conditions as loose and as easy as possible. Um, you know, in the, in the in the hopes of of generating you know some sort of growth uh, in this just totally uncertain time, you know, I I used to think that that uh, Bernanke and then Janet Yellen probably had the most difficult job as head of the Fed in you know at least since the Great Depression, but I, I certainly think that um, uh, Powell is I, the, just the things that are just so unknown. It's just it's going to be so difficult for any kind of planning at all. Well, I feel in in certain uh, you know finance circles, Powell has almost achieved like a cult of personality status. Like I don't remember a uh, a head being such a well known figure to the point where you know even like people who aren't that involved in the market, aren't that involved in in politics, you know, know who uh, Jerome Powell is. You know, his nickname is Jay Powell, yep. and if you spend any amount of time on you know, Reddit or uh, Twitter or Instagram, there are like memes being made about Jay Powell, which is like, I can't remember any memes about Bernanke or anything like that. It's just, it's so funny, the culture around it and how he's, uh, you know, integrated himself into our overall culture at this point. Yeah, he's, he's done well. I mean, I think he's, they've all been, they're all impressive people, right? Obviously, they're all fiercely intelligent and mm. I think the the cult of personality probably began with Greenspan. Uh, Greenspan was a pretty. They used to follow how how thick his his portfolio or attaché was when he walked into meetings to to, to, to trade <laughs> on. Um, you know, but I, and then certainly Greenspan was the first Fed chair that really interacted uh, with people outside of economic circles, um, and, and is is famous for some of the Fed speak that uh, that we all know so well today. Um, but you know, extraordinarily challenging times for them, and, and, and almost an adversarial relationship with with the executive branch as well. So that's you know, uh, on top of that, it's it's a uh, you know, it's just, he's, he's in a very challenging position for sure. Yeah, definitely. So I kind of want to read a headline off to you guys, and let, let's break this down. So the Federal Reserve is now buying bond ETFs. Uh, specifically as part of the stimulus effort to counteract the effects of the coronavirus lockdown, the Treasury gave the Fed $75 billion, which the Fed will in turn leverage 10 to 1 to buy $750 billion in corporate debt. I just want to kind of break that headline down and you know put that both in relation to the CFP exam and also to real life, you know, what is that actually saying here? So first of all, is this... Uh, uh, fiscal or monetary policy? That would definitely be monetary policy. Right. So it's the Fed. It's not Congress. Uh, the C in fiscal is for Congress. So this is definitely a monetary policy. Um, now, the Fed is going out there and buying up, you know, $750 billion worth of corporate debt. You know, what are they hoping to accomplish with that? I, I think what what ultimately all of the moves that the Fed has made. So so if we go back to uh, and I don't remember the specific date, but it was it was uh, you know mid March, the Fed came out uh, on a Sunday night prior to their Wednesday meeting, canceled their Wednesday meeting and dropped rates to zero, um, and that set off you know just alarm bells all over the market. It, it caused people to kind of leap to the conclusion that, oh my God, well, if we can't even wait three days till the meeting, we have to get rates to zero. Things must be even worse than we thought. And we started to see the bottom get put in in the market. And then I think that um, the Fed's reaction to that was to do whatever they needed to do at whatever level they needed to do it to put a giant safety net underneath the economy, which is really what they're supposed to be dealing with. Um, but by proxy, the stock market. Um, and, and since then, we, we, we've seen additional. So, so Jerry, the, the article that you're talking about was, was a subsequent action, which allowed them to buy uh, 
ETFs, bond ETFs uh, from the market. Um, and then following that, they've also been authorized to buy actual individual bonds in the high yield market. Um, and, and so it's, it's really kind of an unprecedented, uh, I don't ever remember individual securities. Uh, I'm sure it's happened in the past, but in, in my uh, career, I don't think I ever remember individual securities being purchased uh, by the Fed. Is the whole thing with that to <clears throat> to keep the money flowing to the companies whose debt is being exactly. purchased yeah. ultimately? Is, is that the whole bottom yep. line? They want to make sure that they don't have what occurred in the onset of the financial crisis where we just had credit markets freeze, right? Capital markets just froze up. No one was willing to, everyone was so afraid. It's actually kind of similar to the, the, what we're seeing with the virus. Everyone was afraid of everyone else. You know, I don't want counterparty <laughs> risk. Right. Um, and, and so I, I can't, I can't risk my survival on, on interacting with your debt. Uh, so I'm going to just going to, we're going to avoid it. And, and we need uh, a capitalist society like ours needs money flowing through the markets. And, and, and uh, you know, we need, we need people who are net savers to provide liquidity to people who are net borrowers. And, and when that doesn't happen, things break. Uh, yeah. And so I think the fed was doing anything that they could to, you know, provide that liquidity, but also, you know, it, it also is kind of a wink and a nod to publicly traded companies say, well, if you get into trouble and it, we can, you just float some high yield bonds and we'll, you know, we've got such a huge appetite for them. We'll snap them up. Um, and it, Didn't they buy a bunch of uh, Walmart debt? Yeah. It, it, Cause that's what puzzled me initially was there, is this money flowing? Are they buying the debt of companies that one might think ordinarily wouldn't need that relief? Yeah, or is it that bad that they all need that relief? And it's, it's a great question, right? So that, I think that's what we're all, it's the same thing with the people. Well, so and I don't want to kind of collude here, fiscal and monetary policy, but the, 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 the PPP loans uh, that were put out by Congress, I mean, there were, there were companies that would have no problem accessing capital markets to get liquidity, taking liquidity from the government. And that's kind of out of the spirit of the agreement. Um, and, you know, uh, with any of these things, especially with the, with the uh, rapid nature of how this was thrown into the, into the mix, there's always going to be these unintended consequences and, and, and things that just aren't fully thought out uh, in, in, the, uh, in the urgency to kind of get it to the market. Um, but yeah, I mean, there's, there's going to be all kinds of, when, when we get some perspective and some, some, distance between us and this event and we can kind of look at you know here's all the things that probably shouldn't have happened i think there's going to be a lot of those and i think that walmart scenario is, is exactly the type of thing that we'd be supporting. yeah and is there potential here knowing uh, of this safety net and the un, um, insatiable appetite to buy debt that companies might be a little more aggressive that's definitely a and, big fear yeah yeah it's this perverse system of risk it, it just it, it doesn't you know, it, it's almost like, uh, uh, not, not exactly, but it's, it's similar to like the too big to fail. Like I know uh, yeah, that, they're not going to let me fail. So I'm just going to go ahead and I'm going to, I'm going to drop the throttle here a little bit and see how far I can get. And if it doesn't, if, you know, if I look like I'm heading for a wall, someone's going to, someone's going to save me. That, that's what I was going to say. Like to me, this whole thing smells as if it's the next level of too big to fail. Now it's not too big to fail. It's too big to suffer. You know, yeah. <laughs> if, you, if if things start to, you know, look, look like a downward slope in the slightest, all of a sudden the Fed comes in for the bailouts to keep that, you know, train train heading up and up and up. You know, st stocks only go up, apparently. <laughs> yeah. Well, and then so so they got this and then that's that's the issue. Right. So so now now from a monetary policy. Now we've, we've had this a little bit since 2008 where, you know, I, I will often with, with students, you know, it's a terrible analogy, but it's, it's almost like a, like a, like a drug addict where you start threatening to pull those drugs away and there's going to be bad reactions. And we actually saw that just yesterday where one of the fed presidents, uh, Kaplan came out and said, you know, in an interview, very logically, right. <laughs> Don't let logic enter it. When things start getting better, we're going to start removing some of these accommodations. And the stock market went from up 400 points to down 200 points. Even though totally logically, right, we're going to, when we don't need these things in anymore, we're going to start taking them out and the market doesn't like that. So now we've, we've reestablished this, this thing where the market is, is uh, uh, the health of the market is reliant on, on uh, you know, emergency level accommodation from the Fed and anything above that is going to create downturns. Yep. 
Now, so from the um, in the individual investor's perspective, right? Do you do you think that seeing that this was getting put into place, that maybe there is a little more security? I mean, does that really get people in a place where where their behavior is going to be like, okay, I feel a little more secure right now, and I can invest, I can buy into the market. I mean, does, is that a big enough indicator to say? All right, I feel I feel more comfortable and confident. Let me just invest invest a little bit into the markets right now. I, I, I think there is a lot of that going on, right? And I, I think okay. that, that that's kind of a confluence of a couple of things. One is the people who well, there's there's some boredom, right? Because people don't have enough to do. Uh, they're seeing other people like um, you know, there's, there's been a, an assortment of, of people who have kind of publicized their day trading, and that makes people think, well, if they can do it, then I can do it. Um, and potentially there's surplus cash because they're getting the extra $600 a week in uh, payroll. Um, and, and so people are kind of people who ha haven't ordinarily kind of thrown money at the market are doing it on, on day trading sites. Um, and so I, I do think that there is going to be some potential negative consequences of that. I mean, we've got a lot of people that haven't really seen a big downturn, you know, outside of what we saw in March, um, they haven't, they haven't experienced that downturn and, and downturns aren't, you know, typically it's not that V shaped bottom, you know, they typically take time to play themselves out and, and we go and revisit the crime scene a couple of times. And, and, uh, uh, it's, it's, it's difficult for people that don't have that historical perspective to appreciate the fact that just because the market's gone up here for the last couple of months, doesn't mean it's going to persist. I, I think the individual investors, especially the older individual investors, are going to be the ones squeezed the hardest because these safety nets that the Fed is putting out there are for these major corporations. They're not for the individual investor. And because the way the market is going and rates are so low on the traditional you know, safety uh, securities like bonds and treasuries, because yeah. those rates are so low, people are being forced to take risks you know, well outside of what their normal risk tolerance would be, because otherwise they're afraid of missing the boat. And so, you yeah, have, and, and so it, it does. So that's the other element of this. So it, it forces people who aren't necessarily comfortable with taking risk way out into either equity risk uh, or high yield bond risk, which is similar to equity risk, um, because it's the, they're starved for income. And, and so they need to go and, and, and find it. And now the problem is, it, let, let's say it's someone that's, you know, in their, in their 50s, 60s, or 70s, this is the third or fourth one of these that they've been through. And, and so, you know, we had the collapse in uh, the dot-com bubble. Then we had the financial crisis in 2008, 2009, now, now this one. Uh, and, and so they're relatively skeptical about the, 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 the long-term prospects of the market. Yeah. Uh, I mean, I, I can say for my generation, also the younger generation is also very skeptical of the market because, you know, we were coming of age during the uh, 08, 09 crisis. Now we're seeing the coronavirus crisis. You know, people, we talk about this a lot on the behavioral finance episodes. Yep. You know, people remember pain a lot more than they remember gains. Yep. So everyone remembers losing a ton of money. Uh, they don't necessarily remember the recovery that comes off after it. And so you just have people who aren't, who, you know, their risk tolerance, they're st sticking to it. They don't want to take those risks. Well, now they're just completely out of the market because there isn't really anywhere else for them to be. So they're just sitting in cash on the sidelines and they're losing out, even though it may not seem it on paper, just when you factor in inflation and opportunity costs and everything, you know, they're losing out just as hard as the people who lost in the, in the downturn. Yeah. Yep. I also think that you've got you know, we, we, we've had at least, we were, we were very located. So, so we had a, we had a very strong correlation between market activity and, and virus activity in, from February to, to April. There's been a bit of a dislocation of that um, where, you know, we're starting to see, you know, spikes in the virus and, and, and we're starting to see uh, shutdowns. We saw a big announcement about shutdowns of, of bars, restaurants, and uh, gyms in California yesterday. And, you're not really seeing the market really price that in, you know, and, 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 um, you know, those, those, th those things are probably behaviorally driven and the fear of missing out. You got people throwing money at this market that probably haven't done it in the past. And, um, 
you know, a lot of people saying that it's got to go back down. I mean, it just has to. Um, and, and so you got people who are kind of frozen. They don't know whether to chase it or, or whether they're going to be right and it comes back down. So they just kind of do nothing. So before we move on to our next topic, because we do have another great topic to talk about today, let's just recap real quick for our students sitting for the exam, their main takeaways here. Um, so for things like the PPE loans and the uh, stimulus checks that went out, uh, those would be fiscal policy because they're coming from Congress. Uh, whereas buying up the bond ETFs and the bonds and the individual securities, uh, that's monetary policy coming from the Fed. Would you say that's that's the big takeaway for people sitting for the exam? What what to keep in mind? Sure, and you know what's the bottom line? What what consequence does this action have in in the marketplace? And where it would be implemented? And I, Adam made a great point earlier from a test perspective: is is understanding you know, or anticipating where we think we are in the business cycle relative to what likely fiscal and monetary policy actions will be done as a result. Um, if, you, if you can understand how those two things work together, and it's really, it's re relatively simple, um, then, you know, you, there, there should be nothing that they can throw at you from an exam standpoint that you can't handle. Awesome stuff, guys. So, up next on our topic list here, let's talk about something that's been making the headlines, at least for financial advisors. You know, might not be making it to the cover of a uh, Newsweek or anything like that, but it's definitely been big news for financial advisors out there. Reg BI is finally coming into effect. It's here. It's finally here, boys. <laughs> Adam, I know you've been uh, looking at this real closely. Can you kind of give our listeners who might not be as familiar with it just a run rundown of what Reg BI is and why it's important? Sure. Um, so Reg BI was uh, a ruling that, that the SEC had adopted. And it deals with retail investors and what they do uh, in relations with uh, their financial professionals. Uh, it's, it's really centered on investment transactions um, and making sure that those investment transactions are all conducted in the best interest of the client. Uh, that's where the B and the I come from in uh, Reg BI, so uh, it's best interest. And if you look down in the, under the hood a little bit, um, there's there's a lot of throwbacks to some of the fiduciary language from from the past. Uh, specifically, Reg BI has some language on disclosure obligations uh, that financial professionals now uh, must uphold. Uh, there's a a duty of care or a care obligation. Um, and there's also some conflict of interest, disclosure, um, and documentation that needs to be uh, taken care of. And, and there's also a compliance element. Uh, so Reg BI was, was put into effect on June 30th of 2020. Um, some people have referred to it as a, as a quasi fiduciary ruling. So it's, it's not quite this expansive uh, when you're when you're working with a client, you are acting in their best interest at all times in all scenarios. Uh, it, it falls a bit short. It's a little more narrow in its scope. Uh, and that the reason for that is that it's really centered on these transactions that are occurring um, that involve broker dealers, financial professionals that are working for broker dealers uh, and ensuring that that the clients, understand that the the financial professionals are working in their best interest another component to this so reg bi is is just this incredibly long uh legalese document there there are a whole bunch of great references out there that kind of break it down into its components and we'll discuss that a little bit here uh but one of the the pieces that has has really needed to be enforced uh, at the level of the financial professionals is this form CRS, which is a relationship summary. Um, so at the beginning of the relationship with a client, this form needs to be completed. It, it includes information about service and fees and costs, uh, standards of conduct, 
and uh, disciplinary history uh, if, if, if that had occurred. Now, in addition to this, there were also some interpretations on uh, the, the 1940 Advisors Act. So Investment Advisors Act of 1940. And uh, specifically, they were, they were looking at this space uh, where a broker-dealer could potentially provide some advisory services. So they're, they're, they're no longer acting in the, in the capacity of a broker or a dealer, uh, but they're offering investment advice and how to handle that. And what the SEC did is they, they issued this interpretation it was called the solely incidental interpretation. And uh, it just basically says in a nutshell that if the advice that you give is, is just, you know, it's something that you're not compensated for. Um, it's not given to the client on a menu of your services as I'm offering investment advice. Um, if you're not specifically in the business in, in your wing of providing investment advice, it would be considered uh, solely incidental. So they gave a little bit of clarification uh, to to some of the old rulings from back in 1940. So it being that there's a lot of components to it, uh, and it's going to affect a lot of people, it has has really caused uh, a lot of feedback in the financial services arena. Um, I'm really glad that we we have Brendan on today because uh, I'm I'm especially interested. In, and how this looked like uh, at, at the practitioner level and, and, and what was done, what needed to be done, and, uh, and how some of those clients uh, responded to, to some of the new documentation and uh, you know, that, that summary relationship that was issued to them. Before we get into that, though, Mike, you know, as a CFP, you know, following the code of conduct, the standards of practice, is there anything you think that we need to do extra now as CFPs or does the, you know, guidelines laid out by the CFP board already pretty much cover what Reg BI is attempting to accomplish? That's a good question. And I think it does. Um, and my perspective on this is is pretty narrow, actually. Um, neither of these the new code and standards with CFP board or Reg BI is going to stop the bad apples. Mm. There have always been some bad apples in the business. There will continue to be some bad apples in the business. Those are the ones that get firms in trouble. If you look at what both of these are asking and then ask any practicing CFP, which of these do you regularly violate uh, <laughs> on a day-to-day -day basis? The answer is never. Plead the fifth. Lead the fan. <laughs> <laughs> uh, you know, I of, of course I, I look after my clients' uh, best interests. It um, you know it's just just a little more clear with the CFP board code and standards um, that at all times. Uh, and, and I get you know I look at this and say, well, if the reg bi language is so specifically centered on securities transactions. And I'm a practicing CFP doing financial planning. That is a whole lot more. That's about a whole lot more than just the securities transactions that go on uh, in, in the relationship. So where does that fall with Reg BI? All of the planning stuff that it doesn't involve trades. Um, whereas with with the code and standards, it's at it, it's at all times that I'm I'm working in the in the client's best interest. So, you know, I I was a little annoyed by all this when it first started happening, but the more I look at it, it's like, you know, CFP board I think uh is on the right track with this. And and those outside of it will continue to have their own problems, the bad apples. Yeah, yeah, you're right. You know, if I'm a CFP and I'm just doing fee-based financial planning and I'll come up with an asset allocation for you, but I'm not going to recommend individual securities to meet those, that asset allocation, um, you know, Reg BI doesn't really affect you nearly as much as, uh, you know, some broker dealers who are, are, you know, selling individual securities on commission. And now that they're both in force, because they, they went, they started being enforced on the same day, I think, right? June, June 30th. At least now, there'll start to be some real-life experience. 
and we'll have some cases that will prompt the SEC to provide clarification, to prompt CFP board uh, for clarification, or Brendan could get super aggressive and, and maybe have some you know, cases named after him yeah. uh, that would help crystallize the thinking on this. I don't think my firm would appreciate that. <laughs> there you want to yeah, be, well, that's be the one thing. Some... In, in this hey. business, you typically don't want a rule named after you. Yeah. Uh, Fla- yeah. Flaherty versus State of Rhode Island. Yeah, the Flaherty that's rule. Right. <laughs> this is, this, these are the terms in which we can execute a financial planner. Yeah. <laughs> So, so good. So Brendan, I'm, I'm one of your clients and I read this article about reg BI and I come to you and I'm like, Hey, what's the deal with this? I thought you were already doing all this for me. What, what's going on here? Yeah. I mean, it's an interesting point. I, I, I think one of the biggest things that reg BI does in principle is it kind of aligns the rules of the industry to the client's expectations of the rules of the industry. I, I think that, uh, you know, most clients would be surprised that that their financial advisors were not necessarily encumbered to act in their best interest. They just had to be able to prove that the advice or the recommendations that they were making was suitable. And that, that's a much lower bar um, than than in, in their best interest. And, and so, um, you know, it's, it's, it's interesting. There was a lot of work that was done by firms to try and comply with I guess the predecessor, maybe a little less, uh, a little bit more significant uh, rule, which was the DOL, Department of Labor rule, um, which was brought in to be put in play in G- uh, January of 2018, I believe. Um, but then it was it was ultimately dissolved. Uh, and that that was just for retirement. That was just for retirement. Planning, yeah, correct. And, and so I, I think the, t- the the taxonomy of this is is that the 2010 Dodd Frank Act had a fiduciary standard in its language, which Congress ultimately forbade the SEC from enforcing. And then the Obama administration said, well, that, you know, that's, that's ridiculous. So we're going to go ahead and we're going to sign an executive order to have the Department of Labor come up with a fiduciary standard because he had direct control over that. Uh, and the DOL rule was born. Uh, but there was a lot of questions that, you know, who's going to enforce it? The DOL can't possibly enforce these rules. Um, can the SEC do it? And so there was a lot of, you know, there was there was just a lot of issues with that overall. But the intent was to protect the, the, the end user. And so I think Reg BI kind of gets there. You know, at least it's 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 not it's not nearly as, um, you know, I think Adam was making a point. It's not it's not fiduciary for real. Right. It's 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 but it's a start. And so I, I think that, um, um, you know, it gets us more on the same page of what, of what we would expect. I think what our clients and, and what individual investors expect of their firms and advisors. Um, and so, you know, interestingly, the form CRS, which Adam was referring to, went out, you know, from, from my firm, uh, Jannie Montgomery Scott, in like mid-June to existing clients. Uh, and I got more calls about that than I've ever gotten from it. clients don't open mail, right? They don't open their statements <laughs> typically. They don't open the mail, which is why when they, you know, get checks, there's red writing saying, please read before you discard. Um, and, and so, but people open this and again, maybe it's going back to the coronavirus. They're just bored and are looking for something to read. Um, but there was a lot of questions as to, Hey, I, I don't understand why, why all of a sudden is this, is this different? And, you know, I would say that this is this has been. You know, I've been a CFP since 2006, and therefore I've I've acted as a fiduciary to you, um, and and so it doesn't change our relationship. But you should be aware that it's not everybody. You know, not everybody has had to act this way. Yeah, to, to me, what it really just comes down to is liability and responsibility. You know, everyone agrees that these things are good. Everyone agrees that this is, these are practices that we should all be doing anyways. It's just no one wants the responsibility or liability. Uh, should something go wrong, you know, firms don't want the responsibility of making sure that it happens. They don't want the liability to open themselves up to lawsuit. If, if a bad apple does come along, you know, the SEC doesn't want the responsibility of enforcing it. It's just, we all agree that this is the good thing. It's just, it seems like everyone's just kind of passing the buck around to see who's actually gonna, you know, 
do the hard work involved with making sure it actually happens. Yeah, and I, I mean, I would, I would hope and I would ex- expect that 85, 90% of the time it, it does, right? I think, I think most people in this, in this business are having their client's best interests at, at heart. I think firms uh, try to, you know, within reason, provide pricing and things like that, that, that do put the client's best, you know, there the used to be that if you put the client money in X, you got paid, you know, a certain amount. If you put the client's money in Y, we're going to run this promotion where you're going to get paid even more, right? You can't do that anymore. You haven't been able to do that for a while. Um, and, and I think that, uh, you know, one of the big differences from a firm perspective that Reg BI doesn't have that DOL it did have was the ability for class action lawsuit. I, I don't think I've not read anywhere uh, that Reg BI would allow for classes to form um, based on you know specific scenarios. So I think that makes it less intimidating for from from a firm level or, or an executive level um, than, than certainly DOL was. Yeah, I mean, I I would agree with you. I would say most advisors do have their best interests in in mind for their clients, but. I also think a lot of advisors kind of lie to themselves about what their best interests no are. <laughs> yep, I agree with that. Like, yep. like I, I can't tell you when I was in the industry how many times I would get, you know, an account transfer and I would look at their holdings I'm like, oh, you've been in C shares for the last 30 well, years. Well, so, so that's, an interesting, <laughs> that's an interesting thing that you bring up because one of, the, one of the, the elements that I think is going to be really interesting to going back to what Mike said, when we start seeing some litigation, uh, is going to be there's specific language inside of Reg BI that says not only do you have to, you know, have reasonable uh, reasons for a buy recommendation or a sell recommendation, but you also need to have it for a hold recommendation, right? That 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 to me, that's from my perspective, wow. that's a big deal, right? So that's that's. <clears throat> Everyone's going to have some reason why they told somebody to buy something or sell something, but to just let something sit there and rot, I, I bet there's not a lot of thought that goes into that. Yeah, 100. Wow. That that is huge because yeah, we've all seen those, and it's like yeah, I'm sure they had their best interest in heart as far as they made the good recommendation as far as the allocation, they made the good recommendation as far as the securities to buy, but then you know once that trade is made, they move on to the next client and they just don't think about, oh, maybe I should, you know, eventually take this client out of C shares and stop getting that, you know, 1% trail on it uh, because they've been sitting in it for, you know, 10, 15, 20 years. Yeah. And I, I think that, that uh, one of the things that from that, that's persisted from DOL is, is firms, I, so I experienced this when I was in Merrill Lynch, certainly experience it now at, at Gianni. Um, and I've heard it from other people. They're really trying to make sure that that you've got a, a, a manageable book of business, not not from a money standpoint, but from a household standpoint. How many households can you reasonably have, uh, and and be able to to do proper due diligence and 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 be effective in terms of giving them advice? If you have a thousand households, you you can't possibly have their best interests and and understand the the level of detail that you need to understand to have a an advisory relationship with, with, uh, with people, um, you know, so, so you need to get your household numbers down to a manageable amount, which is, you know, somewhere probably less than 200. Yeah. Is that, is that in, um, reg BI? Cause I, no, I don't think it, so. I it just, I, yeah. I know it's, it's something like, um, it's, it's, vague it's now it's even before reg BI, even post failure of, of, uh, DOL rule. Um, it's something that, that it's, it's on a dashboard that I look at every day. Here's how many households I have. You know, I, I think that, uh, and here's how many households, here, here's how long it's been since I put a note in uh, indicating that we've had a conversation about something. So, so there's, there's a lot of work to make sure, make sure you're having these conversations, right? And from a legal standpoint, if you don't document those conversations, then they didn't happen. Yeah. And I'll- well, I think that's going to be one of the toughest transitions right there is, is the habit and high quality structure to documentation and, yep. And might that lead down the path, just like you know, phone calls are recorded. Um, yeah, that I all, brought that up. All exchanges with the client be recorded. Yeah, well, firms may not want that to happen either, right? So, uh, yeah, because for every every one thing that may it may save, it may create ten problems. Yeah. Um, you know, and and so we should step back a little bit. Reg BI only deals with transactional IRAs and transactional brokerage accounts. If it's a fee based. Uh, whether it's discretionary or non-discretionary, if it's a fee-based account, uh, Reg BI does not cover it. 
So, so if you're mostly a fee-based business, then Reg BI is really not a big deal for you at all. Um, whereas, um, uh, so I think it's going to push a lot of people into uh, more fee-based accounts. Now, the decision as to whether or not someone should be in a fee-based account or a non-fee-based account is covered by Reg BI. So it kind of gets us through that door. And then when, once you move past that door, there's other, there's other laws that kind of cover your responsibility to the client in, in terms of, you know, whether or not you are adequately uh, giving them what they should be getting for, for the fee that they're paying you. So for those uh, practitioners that are working for a broker dealer yeah. and have their CFP marks, yeah. it's probably safe to say right now that uh, whatever the, the higher standard is, like whatever applies and whatever the higher standard is, is going to carry. Is that a safe way to, to move forward? I mean, I, I, I think from, so, so w when you say is going to carry the day, you mean from a FINRA perspective or from a firm perspective? I think just from a practitioner perspective. Yeah, I would um, say that if, if, if I adhere to the CFP practice standards that I'm going to have, absolutely zero issues with Reg BI ever. Yeah. And, and, and you know, and Mike, Mike, Mike has said this to me a hundred times. So when we were talking about the new practice standards and how firms were kind of reticent to say, well, wait, wait a minute here. Um, Mike would say, well, you know, look at them, open them up, read them. What firm would want to say that we don't do these things? And you know, when you when you put it in that vein, it's it's true. Like that, there. It's just why wouldn't a firm want to do this? Why wouldn't a firm want to provide this service and this level of care to their clients? Well, I think that is a great spot to wrap up today's episode. Uh, I had a lot of fun today, guys. I hope you did too. Good but, stuff. You bet. It yeah. is good. Yes. You can have fun uh, talking about legislation and economics. <laughs> you need to get out of the house more. You make it fun. Sleep last night. I was so excited. It's, oh, wow. It's like, it's like Christmas. Christmas in July. Yeah. <laughs> well, if you're listening to this and you can't wait to get even more awesome Biff Bites content, uh, you can head over to BiffBites.com where all of our previous episodes are stored and you can listen to those. Uh, also, our YouTube channel, the Boston Institute of Finance on YouTube. We have a bunch of tutorial videos uh, and, you know, little snippets to help you with the CFP exam. Uh, as always, feel free to drop us a line uh, and, you know, Feel free to suggest future episode topics that you want to hear. You know, we're always looking for new stuff to talk about. So if there's a burning uh, question that you have, drop us a line and we'll uh, address it in a future episode. Uh, till then, hope you all have a great rest of the month and see you all next month. Thanks, guys. Study on, my friends. Take care. <laughs>